Monday, June the 18th, 2001, East Tilbury, Essex, England. Every morning, 15-year-old Danielle Jones gave her mum a kiss and waved goodbye to her little brother, Mitchell, as she left home to go to school. He used to sit and watch her go out the door, and then he said that she turned left, which was her normal way to go. Only one member of the family would ever see Danielle alive again, her 43-year-old uncle, Stuart Campbell, the man who killed her. He's detailed every phone call they've had, every text message that they've exchanged, and that really does reveal the degree of his fixation and his obsession with her. Campbell was a con artist who preyed on teenage girls. In serial killer mode, this guy had a type, and that was his type. This is what he would target over and over again. He portrayed himself to be a glamour photographer, and he carried a small business card with the title of Cinderella's. At the time, it was the largest investigation ever conducted by Essex police, creating intense nationwide media coverage. Although I knew it was happening, I can remember watching it on the news, and I just completely lost it, because that was the first time I realised they were looking for a body. Stuart Campbell was a predator, posing as a fun-loving, caring uncle. He abused his position of trust and stole his 15-year-old niece from the family who trusted him, and he never gave her back, making Stuart Campbell one of the world's most evil killers. of June 2001, East Tilbury, Essex, England. It was a normal, hectic Monday morning in the Jones household. Dad Tony had left for work at their dry cleaning business, and Mum Linda was seeing 15-year-old Danielle and her two younger brothers off to school. It was Danielle's first day back after returning from a school geography trip. She wasn't a lover of school because she academically she found it quite hard. She always tried her best, and that was all we ever asked of all of our children. But she did find school a bit of a struggle. Over the weekend, Danielle had been oddly quiet and preoccupied, texting furiously on her phone. It was actually Father's Day. She didn't get Tony a card, which was very unlike her. We were going to see my nan, who had earned, turned 100 that year, and we were going to see her, and she didn't want to come, which was really not like her at all. She seemed a little bit agitated. What Linda didn't know was that Danielle had returned home from the school trip to find two love notes hidden in her bedroom. And we know now that she was very, very, very upset about this. She felt that this was a real infringement of her privacy, that he had dared to come into her bedroom and leave two notes for her. And I think clearly this was the rod that broke the camel's back. And from that point, Daniel made it very clear that they weren't going to be friends and there wasn't going to be a relationship. The man who'd left the notes was Danielle's 43-year-old uncle, Stuart Campbell. He came into our family very similar time to when I came into the family. He was going out with Tony's sister. He was welcomed into the family the same as I was. A very character full of life, liked to be the centre of attention, but that's sort of just how we took him and that was how he was, so we didn't sort of think anything of that. But just a very full of life character. As Danielle grew into adolescence, Uncle Stuart began to pay more attention to her. He was a member of this family for nearly 20 years. They accepted him as one of their own and he completely violated all of that trust and all of that acceptance to basically get what he wanted. That relationship initially just seemed like a friendly uncle. But again, it's one of those things in hindsight, they were able to look at it and go, this wasn't friendly uncle, this was grooming uncle. And that was how he was able to get access. The Jones family had no knowledge of Campbell's deviant past. No one knew about the girl held hostage in 1989. No one knew about the four-year prison sentence for robbing a 16-year-old. As far as anyone was concerned, it was just Stuart, Uncle Stu. 
I don't think I wanted to believe it, to be honest with you. But obviously, the more we were told, I then realised that it was him. I think the initial thing was shock because this was a member of my family who I thought loved our children and wouldn't do anything to hurt them. When Danielle Jones left home that fateful Monday morning, she didn't catch the bus to school. Had she agreed to see Uncle Stu, or had she changed her mind, or were they in the midst of an argument? We really don't know. We do know that she changed her route. We do know that she was talking to a man in a transit van, and that was almost without question. Stuart Campbell. Linda never saw Danielle again, and the man who took her, Stuart Campbell, would never reveal what he did to her or where she was. My biggest wish at the moment is that he does one decent thing in his life, and that is to give us our daughter back. Supposedly loving her as much as he did, why does he not want to do the right thing for her and give her back to the family? This killer's story begins on the 21st of February, 1958. Stuart Campbell was born in Malden, Essex, England. We know that he worked as a builder and that he was quite heavily into bodybuilding, but we don't know very much about his early years, his childhood. That seems to be a, a bit of a blank. As a self-employed builder, Stuart Campbell was well known in and around the county of Essex. Local journalist Carl Eve has spent most of his career as a crime reporter in the area. He was described as pretty much a poser. He liked going to the gym, he was big at the gym, he would quite literally pump himself up. He would wear clothes that were very revealing, shockingly revealing, according to some women. But frankly, one of these guys who really loved himself. And he would come in in, in sort of tight-fitting muscle tops and he would always be very flash, or try and be very flash. So it was a guy who wanted to be liked by women. That became very obvious. We often find in people like Campbell, they have these whole chapters of their lives which, which do continue to be a mystery because time and again, they reinvent themselves. They wipe the slate clean, they start again, and they leave behind any kind of chaos that's in their wake. What we do know about Stuart is that from a very early age, really from adolescence onwards, he becomes fixated on teenage girls. They are his obsession. Many people would describe him as a paedophile. I would be tempted to. In 1977, at the age of 19, Campbell accosted a 16-year-old girl in the street in broad daylight. He was sentenced to four years in prison for robbery. When we look back at his offending, when we see these property offences like robbery, we tend to think that they're completely separate from any sort of sexual offending, but they're not, because they're all underpinned by entitlement, a feeling that I have a right to take what I want. So they are part and parcel of his offending profile, which is underpinned by misogyny. When Campbell was released from prison, he found another way to approach impressionable teenage girls. Campbell starts up a so-called photography business where he, he is there to take photos of young girls and he claims that he's going to help them get into the modelling industry. And also, by setting this up in his home, he is in control of that environment. When girls come into his home, he's the one who holds the power. In 1989, he encounters the police again, this time for effectively abducting a 14-year-old and keeping her hostage on the pretext of photographing her. He doesn't get away with it, but equally, he doesn't get a prison sentence. He's simply given 12 months suspended. Now, a suspended sentence is essentially he's walked away from court. He's got a bit of a slap on the wrist. And this simply validates and legitimises his behaviour. Campbell met his first wife, Jennifer, in 1975, when she was just 15 years old and he was 17. They married a year later when Jennifer was six months pregnant with their daughter. But he's always grooming, and it's a word that particularly applies to Stuart Campbell, and he identifies another 15-year-old while he's still married to Jennifer, and this one 
It's called Debbie. Debbie Jones and Stuart Campbell were together for 13 years before marrying in 1996. Debbie had a brother called Tony, who was married to Linda, and they had three young children, two boys, Ryan and Mitchell, and their big sister, Danielle. Twelve-year-old Danielle was a beaming bridesmaid at Debbie and Stuart's wedding. He appears to be, I think, quite a cool uncle. He's into bodybuilding, he's quite a good-looking guy, and I think he's somebody that Danielle probably looked up to in the beginning as a father-uncle figure, as an authority figure, and someone who she probably had quite a lot of respect for. Campbell was a regular visitor at Tony and Linda's home in East Tilbury, Essex. They trusted him. He was, after all, a father himself. Their children thought he was the perfect uncle, always happy to play with the kids, especially Ryan and Mitchell. When the children were young, he showed less interest in Danielle. It was only when she started to reach the age 14 to 15, which was effectively the age of the girls he liked, that he would turn up more, and he would spend more time and find more excuses to turn up, and he would come around and play video games with the two younger brothers. That really was you know, how he kept the contact constant. It's a grooming process. I don't think the parents saw anything odd in him turning up, because, in effect, he's family. Little did the family know that the loving, caring uncle that Campbell portrayed was merely a cover-up. His true intentions would soon be revealed. 2001, East Tilbury, Essex, England. Stuart Campbell was spending more time than usual with the Jones family, finding every opportunity to pop into their home for a visit. He even had his own key. He was also paying a lot more attention to his niece, Danielle. When Danielle gets to around about age 15, Campbell's interest in her seems to ramp up. And we know that Campbell met both of his wives when they were 15. So he has this kind of fixation with young girls who are ever so slightly under age. So history seems to be repeating itself. Tony and Linda had no reason to suspect that Campbell had any ulterior motive. I felt we were quite a loving family. She liked to boss the boys around to a degree. Um, yeah, I, I felt we were just a fairly normal, loving family. And Danielle was a normal teenage girl. The older he gets, the more he preys on the unexpecting, naive young girl who is just blossoming. I mean, that in, in essence, that's the element. He likes to choose girls who are on the cusp of blossoming into adulthood. Campbell often picked Danielle up at school in his blue transit van. He'd take her shopping, buy her gifts, and they'd go to the cinema together. It was perfect because he had that access. He could always excuse it, and he could keep on approaching her, whereas anyone else, his parents would say, what are you doing around my house? What are you doing with this girl? With her, he could always go, you know, this, this is my niece. Danielle had a passion for animals, especially dolphins were her favourite, and she did get to stroke a dolphin in Florida, um, and she loved children. And she was doing a course at school, like a nursery nurse type course, and I'm sure that she would have gone on to work with young children. Young children especially was her thing she liked the best, like preschool probably. Danielle's love for children gave Campbell an opportunity to exploit. He and Tan's sister were expecting a baby, which obviously Danielle was thrilled about, the fact of having a little niece or nephew. He would show her things he'd bought, he'd meet her from the school bus and then say he'd got things to do on this estate, come with me, I'll show you what I've bought. And he was taking a fair amount of interest in her, but then it's really hard hindsight now, we can see things weren't right, but at the time it was just, he's shown everything with the baby, she's so excited about the baby and we didn't, particularly think anything of it at the time. Campbell really had started to cross the line. He's gone from being a helpful uncle who picks Danielle up from school to being somebody who is spending rather too much time with her. So they are literally hanging out together. And I'm not putting any blame for one moment on Danielle here. The perpetrator of this dreadful crime is Stuart Campbell. 
he's the adult. But it's clear that there was a connection between the two that was quite vivid. It wasn't fluffy, it was quite strong. I think Stuart was biding his time, waiting for a moment in which he could, well, I'm afraid, do what he wanted with Danielle. East Tilbury, May 2001. The Jones family went on holiday to France, and when they got back, Danielle went on a school geography trip. She'd been separated from Campbell for some time. But Campbell still had access to the family's home and Danielle's bedroom. The whole family had gone away on holiday, and that's when he'd gone into the house and left all these notes, handwritten notes. Hope you're great, I really miss you, all this thing. I miss your smile. Very creepy. Hi, Princess. Hope you have a lovely holiday. Text me when you get back. Love, Stuart, and then there's a kiss underneath. So this would be one of the ones that he dropped off at the house whilst they were away. Another one. Hi, Princess. In case you missed my last note, I just thought I'd pop in another to let you know I do miss your smile, and then it's cock XX. Now, this is incredibly intrusive, incredibly invasive, and it's evidence of a real obsession, a real fixation on Danielle. And rightly, she starts to feel incredibly frightened by this and incredibly rattled by it. On the 16th of June, when Danielle returned from the school trip, her mum, Linda, noticed something was wrong. She came home on the Friday night and over that weekend, she wasn't quite herself. There was a lot of texting and things weren't quite right that whole weekend. She kept popping out around the shop. I've got to go around the shop and a lot of texting going on, but we just thought, oh, perhaps she's had a fallout with a friend. And so it was a bit of a strange weekend. We look back now at it, you know. Yeah, she wasn't her normal self that weekend at all. And I think her friends in particular would have been more aware than, than her family of the communication that was going on between the two of them. And I think the reaction of Danielle's friends was perhaps something of a wake-up call for her, which she realised, actually, this is something that is out of the ordinary. This is something that, that is quite intrusive and invasive, and it's making me feel uncomfortable. And eventually she kind of woke up to reality, woke up to how creepy he is. And her friends were saying things like, yeah, he's come around. She's like, oh, God, not him. Oh, God. And started to spurn him. So we know that the spurning process was happening at the same time in the weeks leading up to her disappearance. On Monday, June the 18th, 2001, Danielle left for school as normal. Well, it was her first day back after her trip away. Seemed perfectly normal that morning. She got up as usual kiss me goodbye. Ryan was already at senior school. Mitchell was still in junior school, so he would wait till she'd gone and then go and get ready. She went out as normal. He used to sit and watch her go out, the, out of the door. And then he said that she turned left, which was her normal way to go. And then she turned back around and walked back past the house the other way. Didn't think anything of it. Thought perhaps she'd had a text from a friend who was waiting around the other corner. Didn't think anything unusual about that, to be honest. The question that haunts me is why that particular June day? Was it a crime of opportunity or was it a crime of premeditation? What was it about that day in June 2000 that made Campbell act the way he did? What was it that provoked him on that particular day? Was it an argument with Danielle? Was it Danielle refusing to do what he wanted? Or was it more sinister even than that, that he'd persuaded her somehow to do something? I simply don't know. When the victim decides to step away and say they've had enough and, and distance themselves from the abuser, the abuser decides to take the control back to say to the victim, you don't get to decide this, I get to decide this. And this is a very dangerous time. When there is that separation, the risk of homicide increases exponentially. At 2.30 p.m. on the 18th of June, Linda received a phone call. I got a phone call from the school to say that Daniel hadn't been at school, which wasn't something Danielle would do. She would be a bit of a scaredy cat, not going to school. They then said, well, we're quite surprised, 
give us five minutes, we'll go and double check this. They phoned me back and said, no, she's definitely not at school. 15-year-old Danielle Jones had vanished. Only the man in the blue transit van knew where she was. East Tilbury, Essex, England, Monday the 18th of June, 2001. 15-year-old Danielle Jones hadn't turned up for school, something that was totally out of character for her. I waited for Ryan to come home to see if he'd seen her at school. He said he hadn't, but that wasn't unusual. She didn't come home. I, I, I probably left it a little while thinking, well, if she has done something, she'll come home as though she's just got off the bus. Time was going on, so I started phoning her friends, who then all confirmed she hadn't turned up for school. Danielle had vanished into thin air. No one knew where she was. What was in her mind? What had been agreed between them? Had there been a falling out? Had he said, you've got to talk to me? Or had she said, I don't want to see you again? Linda called her husband, Tony, and asked him to come home. She also called the missing persons hotline, who told her to call the local police. For some reason, Tony, on his way home, decided to call at his sister's house. She was at work. But he looked through the window, because he felt that when knocking on the door, he felt someone was there, but they didn't answer the door. So he looked through the window and laid out on the lounge floor with a load of camera equipment. On the same day, Detective Sergeant Keith Davies from Gray's police station in Thurrock responded to Linda's call. In the very beginning, when Daniel went missing from East Tilbury, obviously there was an awful lot of house-to-house -house inquiries taking place to see if there'd been any sightings of Daniel. And the young man, who I think was only five years old, had reported seeing someone he thought was Daniel arguing with a man with a blue transit van. And having spoken to Daniel's friends, they identified that her uncle, Stuart Campbell, had a blue transit van. So he became a person of interest fairly early on in the inquiry. I think at the time, obviously, I didn't dream in a million years that anything, as it turns out, would happen. I just thought she'd had a fallout with someone or was, had gone off to sort a problem out. But when we started looking into Stuart Campbell, we realised that he'd been involved in various offences over the past 20 years, starting off with burglaries in and around the local area, but very quickly moving on to taking indecent images of young girls, generally around 13, 14 years of age. The Jones family knew nothing about Campbell's sordid history of offences. We discovered when we started to look into his past and his background, he, he portrayed himself to be a, a, a glamour photographer and he carried a small business card with the title of Cinderella's. He never was officially a photographer at all. When Campbell met Debbie, his wife, he essentially wanted to leave his past behind because his offending history was completely inconsistent with the character that he was creating. He was trying to create this figure of the trustworthy, regular guy, the family man, the father. His past really identified to us that he was an extremely confident individual. He was able to gain the trust of these young girls very, very quickly. So much so that he would, when he did take photographs of them, he would be confident enough to take them back to his own home address. So very quickly, he would have emerged on the police's radar as the prime suspect, and, and they would want to know exactly what he'd been doing on the day that she disappeared. He had a previous conviction for taking a child without consent, which ended up being a much lower charge. But eventually, when we got to talk to the victim of that crime, it was a great deal more than that and actually involved an indecent assault and indecent photographs being taken of that person. 21st of June 2001. After the extent of Stuart Campbell's past was revealed, the case was referred to Detective Chief Superintendent Stephen Reynolds, head of the Major Investigation Section of the Crime Division in Essex. Usually, when children go missing, they are found very, very quickly. That said, as a detective, you're always taught that every missing person has the potential of being a murder victim, and you should never discount that until there is evidence to the contrary. 
As police continued their inquiries, the tight-knit community of East Tilbury and the local Essex media did everything they could to help find Danielle. It's a fair sized estate where we live, and obviously some people know who she was, some people didn't, so we did a leaflet drop. We were still searching, family were still searching, friends were still searching. On the way to school, some children would look to see if they could see any signs of it. The community were really good in, in trying to help as well. I think we got a photo very soon afterwards. So it would have been in about two or three days. That's the sort of point where a person going missing, it gets from, we're a bit concerned to, we need to let the media know we need to do a wider appeal. There's something a bit more worrying about this. In the picture of Danielle with her long hair and her school uniform and a blazer is imprinted on my mind and will ever be. You can't forget it. It's vivid. Everyone was out searching except him. He actually came round through that first week and came in with a magazine on family trees, doing family trees, because that's what I was doing at the time. And I was like, what am I interested in this for at the moment? It's just whole behaviour was not like someone that loved his niece and was desperate to find out what happened to her. Just bizarre behaviour. Campbell didn't actually join in the search. He didn't help look for her. And I think this was a very deliberate move on his part. I think he's smart enough to realise that the people close to Danielle are going to be under a lot of scrutiny, because in most cases, when a child comes to harm, it's at the hands of, of somebody within their family. So this is a very cunning move on his part. He just removes himself from the limelight altogether. But in doing so, makes himself all that much more suspicious. Investigators had to be sure that Danielle hadn't planned to leave home. When Daniel was first reported missing, Gray's police conducted some initial inquiries, and these inquiries included searching Danielle's home and also her bedroom. It was ascertained very quickly that she hadn't taken any clothes and items which one would have thought she really needed like a mobile phone charger, was still present in the house. And the feeling now was that she was either being held against her will or that, sadly, she may have already been murdered. On the 22nd of June 2001, Stephen Reynolds and his team made a decision to arrest Campbell. There was no identified offences. We had no evidence to charge him with any offence but he hadn't really said much about Danielle's whereabouts. Campbell showed the police a text message he claimed was from Danielle, sent after her disappearance. Hi, Stu. Thanks for being so nice. You are the best uncle ever. Tell Mum I'm so sorry. Love you loads. Dan. He gave an account that on the morning that Daniel went missing, he had had to drive to the Wix DIY store which was just along the A13 to buy some spare parts. And then when he returned, he started working on his neighbor's uh, decking that he was planning to do. With Campbell in custody, the police were able to search his house for any sign of Danielle. Campbell is still, at this point, maintaining his innocence because Campbell is a very confident man. Underneath all that exterior, he doesn't believe for one second that they will be able to convict him without a body. He's utterly certain in his own mind, because he's a builder and because he knows what he's doing, that he's concealed the body so effectively that they'll never find it. So they can say what they like. Where's the body? Investigators found nothing to justify detaining Campbell further and he was released on police bail. Whilst Campbell was on bail, the investigation continued at a pace to try and gather evidence sufficient to charge him. But also, we still didn't know for sure that Danielle was dead. There was still a remote possibility that she could be alive. East Tilbury, June 2001. With insufficient evidence to hold him, Stuart Campbell was released on police bail. But the police were convinced that Campbell was responsible for Danielle's disappearance, and he was their only person of interest. Initially, 
Campbell was put under surveillance to see if there was anything in his movements that would assist us in locating Daniel, be it hopefully alive or sadly if a body was found. But regretfully, that wasn't successful. So then the inquiry went off in a number of directions. We looked at his alibi and it was clear that that alibi was a false alibi. In 2001, mobile phone technology was in its infancy and triangulating mobile signals was still a specialist field. Campbell had claimed to be at a DIY store in Rayleigh on that Monday morning, yet his phone was in East Tilbury and so was Danielle. Both phones were picked up by the same mast, meaning they were within a mile of each other. So in the very early stages, we had a considerable search for Danielle for obvious reasons, and that was really responding to any sightings that members of the public were letting us know about. And this was predominantly around the East Tilbury area, which is vast in relation to open land, railway tracks, and very heavy growth, but they were actually searching in all of those areas, including waterborne environments, rivers and lakes. East Tilbury is kind of like a little square of concrete, and around it you have the Essex marshes, really. It's, it's the stuff out of Charles Dickens' period, where it's just marshland and wetland, and you're very, very close to the estuary, so it's silt and mud. There are industrial works, abandoned industrial works. There's sort of the remnants of dockland-type areas. So it's a vast area. It's a really large area to cover, and it was broken up into bits. And the searches, from what I understand, went from the day she went missing up to the day before the trial. And they were methodically planned. I think it was cut up into areas. We're going to search this area and this area and this area. The extensive search attracted intense media attention. By the Saturday, they asked us to do a press conference. Um, they took us to our local police station and we were sort of told what would happen. But I don't think anything quite prepared me for what was to happen. It was quite a frightening experience, really. And on the way there, we were told that very few couples survive anything like this, which at the time I thought, you know, but that happened to be one of the best bits of advice they ever gave us, because we then decided to, well, we are going to stay together and fight this. But the press conference was very daunting. I think I broke down and blew my nose, and the cameras just went absolutely berserk at the fact that I'd broken down, I think. It, it was quite a frightening experience, really. The investigation was called Operation Spinnaker, and the Essex police invested over £1.7 million into trying to find Danielle. It was, at the time, the largest investigation ever conducted by them. As the search for Danielle continued, the investigation into Stuart Campbell gained momentum. The police looked back at the suspended sentence Campbell had received in 1989 for the abduction of a 14-year-old girl. We also managed to identify a number of other victims, female victims of various ages, where he'd either inappropriately taken photographs of them or, in some cases, committed sexual offences on those women. On the 17th of August 2001, evidence from Campbell's past behaviour was enough to convince the Crown Prosecution Service that he should be re-arrested. He was charged with possessing a rather large amount of drugs with a couple of assaults on other people. They basically gathered loads of evidence from other places as part of their investigation, and it was like, right, we'll throw everything at you. So initially, he was charged with a whole load of things. That was important for us because at least he was off the streets and we could then continue our investigation and try and gain that additional evidence to satisfy the Crown Prosecution Service that there was sufficient evidence to charge him with murder and abduction. The day that they charged him was awful, really, because that was the day we actually had to sit our two boys down and tell them that. I think they picked up that he was a suspect, but to actually then tell them that he has been charged with the murder of their sister was quite horrific. The police now had the opportunity to conduct an in-depth search of Campbell's home. 
During that second search of Stuart Campbell's house, one of the most predominant findings was a bag that was found in the loft of his home address. And inside this bag, there were a number of pieces of lingerie, some handcuffs, and it was quite clear that this was a bag of clothing that he utilised when he had brought young girls back to his home to take photographs of. In Campbell's house, a range of different evidence is discovered by the police. There is some physical forensic evidence, so there's a pair of stockings with Danielle's blood on them. There's also a lip gloss that belonged to Danielle. So those things in themselves are quite incriminating. But the police also find Campbell's diary. There was a diary found in Stuart Campbell's home address that in many respects got referred to as the Daniel Diary, not because Daniel wrote it, but it was exclusively about his relationship with Danielle and how she had behaved on a particular day. And it went to show really his obsessiveness, uh, his obsession with Daniel Jones. As the investigation progressed, we were finding lots of things out about him which were quite shocking, that girls were coming forward to say that he'd posed as a photographer and varying different things. And that was very unnerving, the fact that he'd almost led this secret life, which we had no idea about. And that was not nice to think that we'd had him in our home, had him around our children, trusted him. And the biggest betrayal of all is that he appears to have done something to our daughter. It's one of the most complicated cases for any police force to prove murder without a body. It is very complicated indeed, and presents the Crown Prosecution Service and eventually the prosecution at trial with enormous number of difficulties. We didn't really feel we'd had sufficient evidence because this was a very unusual case that it was a bodiless murder. So we had to prove not only had Daniel been murdered and then she'd not simply run away, but also that Stuart Campbell was responsible. The evidence was presented to the Crown Prosecution Service. The CPS initially did not feel that we had sufficient evidence to bring a charge of murder and kidnap against Stuart Campbell. We continued with piecing the case together and eventually one of the senior Crown prosecutors in Essex took a week off away from his normal work to actually review all of the evidence that we had gathered. And at the end of that, he was satisfied that there was sufficient evidence to put Campbell before a court charged with murder and kidnap. The 14th of October, 2002, Chelmsford Crown Court, Essex, England. After 11 months on remand and still pleading his innocence, Stuart Campbell went on trial for the abduction and murder of his 15-year-old niece, Danielle Jones. The last thing you want to do is open the case high and then close it low. So it's best to open it in a very level way without any emotion, simply pointing out the questions that the jury might wish to ask. Stuart Campbell's defense, effectively, it wasn't me and I wasn't there, that Daniel has upped and run away and I have nothing to do with it. The evidence was circumstantial, which I'm sure everybody knows, means that there was no direct evidence. Nobody had seen the killing. There was no admission from Stuart Campbell that he was responsible. And there wasn't that much by way of direct forensic scientific evidence. Taking the stand was not a nice experience at all. I think I was on there for about three days. Not a nice experience at all with him sitting there. I tried not to look, but it was very uncomfortable with him sitting there, very uncomfortable. Throughout the trial, the prosecution team continued building their case. Somewhere in the region of between 50 and 60 additional statements were taken during that 11-week trial in an effort to make what we thought was our strong case even stronger. Albeit circumstantial, the prosecution had gathered some powerful evidence against Campbell. Some lip gloss was found in his attic, and on the brush, or whatever you call it, of the applicator, 
her DNA was found, or there was a fairly significant match. But I think the thing that helped convict him was the significant cell site data, the telephone evidence, which showed that he had lied on the day in question, and there had been a very strong relationship between these two phones in the very early days after Daniel went missing. Further forensic authorship analysis of the text message Campbell had claimed was from Danielle revealed it was not from Danielle, as she always texted in lower case. The text had been sent by Campbell from her phone to his. That was one of those killer moments, you thought. The technology has stuffed you. Nothing else has been able to put you at the scene. Nothing else has been able to nail you as a liar as much as this technology. And so putting all of that together, opportunity, motive, and a little bit of scientific evidence, plus the blue van, and the fact that she disappeared made quite a compelling case. I think, to be honest, I had a glimmer of hope. Right up until the trial, I think there was always that minuscule of hope that it was wrong. The 19th of December, 2002, Chelmsford Crown Court. Stuart Campbell was found guilty and was sentenced to life imprisonment for murder and a further 10 years for abduction. It was ruled that Campbell should serve a minimum of 20 years before being considered for parole. Stuart Campbell's demeanor through the entire court case and even at the end when he was sentenced was just stone cold. There was nothing there. I think what makes this case exceptional for me is the fact that the police were able to gather sufficient evidence to stand up in court to convince a jury. I think they did an incredibly good job here because gaining a conviction without a body is a very difficult thing to do. I think from the police's point of view, jubilation, that they'd got the result they wanted. So it was a very strange feeling, really, yes, We'd got the result we wanted, but the thing we wanted most of all was Danielle back, and to this day, still haven't got that. So, a mixed blessing, you know. Yes, someone's going to pay for this, but we want Danielle back. Stuart Campbell will only be 63 years of age when he's eligible for parole. Linda Jones has become an advocate and campaigner to create a legal precedence for a no-body, no-parole directive. On the 9th of February, 1988, 22-year-old insurance clerk Helen McCourt from St Helens, Merseyside, disappeared less than 500 yards from her home. Her killer, Ian Sims, was paroled without ever revealing the location of her body. Marie McCourt, her mother, spent years lobbying for laws to help other families find closure by denying parole to murderers who failed to disclose the location of their victims. The prisoner's disclosure of information about Victims Act or Helen's Law finally came into effect in 2021. Yeah, our hope is that Helen's Law will make it so much harder for him to come out and that the fact that the parole board have to take into consideration the fact that he's not disclosed where the body is. So we're just hoping that it makes a big difference to him getting parole. Unfortunately, Mary's daughter's murderer came out before the law came into force, but fingers crossed we probably will be the first people that hopefully it will help. Personally, I think it gets harder the years go on. Her friends have all got children. Our sons have got children. We know she would have had children, and it's just a constant there that there's so much of her life that we never got to share. Stuart Campbell was a serial abuser who immersed himself into a loving family who trusted him. He callously violated that trust to get what he wanted and continued to torture the family by denying them the peace of laying their beloved daughter to rest, making Stuart Campbell one of the world's most evil killers.